Well, thank you very much indeed, Jack. Uh, yeah, I'm, my name's Fiona Gale. Um, for quite some time, I worked in the area as county archaeologist in Denbyshire. I'm retired now, and I've got myself involved in various um, archaeological activities, one of which is being involved with the Rithin Castle Conservation Trust, which has been in existence for a number of years. So tonight I was hoping to just give you a little bit of background to the site. The reconstruction picture that you can see there um, was put together with funding from the Cambrian Archaeological Association and Castle Studies Trust. Uh, Chris Jones Jenkins involved with that and Sean Rees and Will Davis. Uh, an idea of what Rithin Castle may have looked like uh, in its early years, heyday, I guess, when it was really um, operating as a medieval castle. Uh, what does it look like now, though? And where is it? We're within right in the middle of the Vale of Cluid. I hope you can see the arrow that I'm moving around, but we're right in the middle of the Vale of Cluid. Um, and nowadays, this is what the castle looks like. This is an aerial view. Um, we've got Predominantly, you see a building, and I suspect many of you will have visited that building. It's a hotel, a family wedding or whatever. A lot of people will have been to the hotel and not perhaps seen the medieval remains, which are extensive. From this um, aerial view, where my um, little arrow is at the moment, the medieval castle still standing starts uh, in one corner here most of this curtain wall is surviving back gate postern gate curtain wall coming around here and background here with a main gatehouse here so there's a lot of the medieval castle surviving very nothing on the interior of it but there is much much more of the medieval castle surviving and I think many people appreciate, many people even who live in the town, they will think of it as a hotel rather than the medieval castle surviving. This plan, uh, which uh, Cadu, Will Davis at Cadu put together, um, shows that basically on this, everything that is gr this gray color is medieval masonry surviving. So all the way around here, here, to that corner turret where I started on the aerial photograph and here. So a substantial amount of the medieval castle does survive. This next illustration looks, it's that same plan, just mm -hmm. somewhat more complicated no with um, the different elements of the remains name so that when we talk about it, uh, we know which bit we're all talking about. Work that I'm going to talk about later concentrates on this great gatehouse here in the green box. But just a bit of background, from the protection point of view, Rithin Castle, the medieval remains, are all a scheduled ancient monument. So on the um, screen here, the red line denotes the edge of the scheduled monument. The hotel building is not within the scheduled monument, but all of this area is. So that's scheduled ancient monument. The blue dots, of which there are lots within Rithin, and one here for the actual hotel building and one here for a feature in the garden, um, these are listed buildings. And the hotel buildings of Rithin Castle are listed as grade two star. As you see, a number of buildings within Rithin are listed buildings. So the castle is scheduled ancient monument the building within it the later building which we'll talk about more soon is a listed building and it's not only those designations these rather scruffy um, pictures here show you the this is an extract from the historic um, parklands um, document that was um, put together i think in the early 90s Rithin Castle and the grounds are an historic parkland. So, and that now has statutory um, protection within the planning process. So it's scheduled, it's listed, it's historic parkland. It's also 
within the area or this pink is the area of the conservation area within Rhythm. So there's all these levels of protection, um, some of which work, some don't, but it means from an owner's point of view, um, there is a lot of um, hoops potentially that they have to jump through to be able to do anything to the site. And the site is privately owned. So a bit of history to Rithin Castle. It's part of the uh, range of castles in northeast Wales and across North Wales and Wales indeed that are linked to the campaigns of Edward I, the English king coming in to Wales to effectively take over. 1277, Edward I comes into Wales. Uh, he has uh, Henry de Lacy is his um, leader coming in through the Dee Valley. He's also coming in along the northern coast of Wales. So uh, coming from Chester, establishing a base at Flint and then onto Fridland and then further west. 1277, he is apparently successful. One of the Welsh princes, David at Griffith, allies himself with Edward. Um, everything seems fine, Edward seems to be in control, Davith is his ally, and Davith is given Dufferin Cluid, the Vale of Cluid, and charged with building a castle. However, five years later, Davith rises up against Edward, attacks Harden Castle, uh, and again, Edward is successful in defeating um, that Welsh uprising, but then gives Rithin and Dufferin Cluid, the lordship of Dufferin Cluid, to his Baron Reginald de Grey, who is charged then with completing or building a castle. Now, we don't know what, if anything, of the, what we see today relates to work from David at Griffith. Most, we think, relates to the work of Reginald de Grey, partly because the features that do survive are more similar both to other sites that he was involved with and to sites of that period. The Rithin Castle, what we look at today, predominantly is started being built 1282. Edward I does come to Rithin briefly in October 1282 and he brings with him his architect, Master James of St George, so that he's got some input into the design of the castle, but basically it is Reginald who is charged with building it and presumably raising a lot of the um, taxes and funds from the local population who don't want him there in the first place to construct it. Just over 100 years later, in 1400, Oanglindur, uh, his first um, attack in his rebellion is on Rithin. It, it's got his, uh, his reason, in a way, for falling out, all goes back to a sort of personal disagreement between the Degrees and Glindur, and that's what sparks off his uprising um, in 1400. The town is attacked and the castle, but the castle remains, um, it, it is held by the de Grays. However, by 1632, there is a survey of the castle and it would appear to have been in a very derelict state. And at that stage, it is sold to the Middletons, Thomas Middleton of Chirk Castle. The castle was refortified to an extent by the Royalists during the Civil War. We, don't know exactly how much or what was um, refortified. The survey done 15 or so years previously does describe the castle as being ruinous, except for the great great house where there is it, it indicates that there is accommodation. Whether it is just that area that the uh, royalists are holding, or whether they have refurbished more, we don't really know. There is a lengthy siege in. Rithin, um, but eventually, as with um, pretty well everywhere else, the castle falls to the parliamentarians who are then in control. The castle is then slighted, deliberately damaged, such that um, it cannot be used in the same way again, it cannot be um, used as a fortification. And this happens to very many of the uh, castles in the area. And it was ruinous and 
empty and nothing much going on in it for nearly 200 years still in the ownership of the Middletons. Uh, and it's not until the uh, 1820s that um, a, the house is built within the medieval castle remains. Initially, uh, the site is inherited by Harriet Middleton. Her sister Maria uh, inherits Chirk Castle and she inherits um, Vithin Castle, along with other lands in um, the Cuidian Range and various other parts of um, the locality. She builds this up house that is in the upper image here, predominantly limestone house. You can see this, hopefully you can see my arrow here. This is the medieval curtain wall and she builds a house within it. 25 years or so later, her nephew, son of her, her sister, inherits, well, she dies with uh, no having never married, has no children, and he knocks down part of the house that she built. So some of this part is knocked down and builds a grand red sandstone structure, which is the part that you see today. If you've been to the hotel, this is the entrance that you come in today. We haven't got a lot of documentary evidence about Rithing Castle. It, it, believe me, it has been looked for, but we haven't found very much. There is this early 17th century plan and little bird's eye view, bird's eye view here, uh, put together by Randall Holm. The plan is pretty accurate. It's that same, you know, if you look at this, um, this is the plan of what it is today. It's the same pentagon shape. The house covers up this part of the castle. But late 17th, uh, early 17th century, sorry, late um, time, we've got this hall area here with what looks to be a little corridor. We've got the turrets that survived. We've got the great gatehouse. We've got a chapel and various other buildings and the central ditch, which is still there to see today. What's missing today is the turret here, here, and this part of the wall. Yeah. There are a couple of other prints. This is a buck print from the middle of the 18th century, looking at the postern gate, the sort of back door of the castle and the curtain wall here. So this is before the house was built and the town of Ruthin here with its church here. Now the perhaps some, one of the main features of um, Ruthin church now is its steeple. Uh, not visible there because it was only added on in the Victorian period. There's also some uh, mapped evidence, 1826, this uh, map here shows the castle. This is pretty much when Harriet Middleton started building her house in this area here. The main road from Corwen was running right in front of the castle. Pretty quickly that was moved and the road diverted it so that you didn't have the main road running right past your grand uh, stately home here. The mansion house, uh, and there's a whole story to be told about the family who lived in that, the Middletons becoming the Cornwallis West, links with Edward the uh, uh, Seventh, and all sorts of shenanigans going on. Um, but it remained in the um, family, the Cornwallis West family, until the early 1920s. There was all sorts of bankruptcy and all sorts of um, money. Basically, the money was spent. The uh, inheritance or debt was on the house and it needed to be sold. And the mansion house, the grand stately home of which this is the part built by the red sandstone part built by Cornwallis West, um, was sold to Duff House Private Hospital. Now there was a Duff House Private Hospital in Scotland and they were looking to extend. It, um, it's difficult to work out what exactly what type of hospital it was. It wasn't some way where you'd go to, um, I don't know, have an operation. It, it was more um, a non-specific illnesses. Some people have suggested something a bit like the Priory today, but we're not really sure about that. But certainly people like Laurence Olivier came 
to the hospital here in Rithin um, because people locally have his autograph when he went into the local um, news agents. Um, so the house became this rather grand private hotel, plenty of space to convalesce from whatever it was you needed to convalesce from. And the hospital added wings onto the um, original mansion house. So hopefully, again, you can see my little arrow here. The mansion house is this part and this part. The, ho the hospital added on this whole wing here and built a nurse's home down here. Coach house to the, the um, mansion houses here and they did some alterations there. So they added quite extensive wings onto the mansion house. The house, when it was both a private house and a hospital, the grounds were developed as picturesque gardens, hence there being now a registered park and garden on the um, register. And at that sort of time when they were being developed in the middle of the 19th century and still when in the 20th century when it was used as a hospital, the medieval remains provided this ideal back, backdrop of picturesque ruins. You didn't have to build a mock ruin, you had ruins in your garden already. Um, and I think that is really why we now have the castle in the parlor state that it is currently, because that's what people wanted, ruinous gardens with ivy growing all over them. We have a few pictures of what um, some of the hospital um, clinic rooms look like. Now, as I say, it is a hotel. It was bought in the 1960s uh, by a family, stayed in their ownership till early 2000s, and it's had two owners since then. Uh, and it is marketed as an upmarket hotel, ideal place for weddings, that sort of thing. Um, here we have, you know, this is part of their publicity uh, of the sort of things that they can offer. Weddings are a big deal. Peacocks are a big deal. Uh, and their trip advisor thing that they are making the most of their historic past. Castle dates back to the legend of King Arthur. Now that's, there is a stone within the center of uh, Rithin that is supposedly where Gildas's brother had his head chopped off by Arthur stretching it a bit to say it was the castle and um, but yes Edward I did own it Henry VIII and Elizabeth I but not necessarily in the way that is put forward there so of all the castles linked to Edward I campaign into Wales it, it's in it's in perhaps the worst condition partly as I say because the it, when it was a house they wanted ruinous gardens they wanted these this backdrop to the nice italian gardens that they have here of these crumbling walls with all this ivy growing on them um but it does stand out as having very little descri antiquarian description academic study now and conservation um it is as i say there arguably um one of the most historic significant Welsh castles to have escaped that TLC, that tear. So we are in a state where we are now with a lack of maintenance on the medieval remains, which has led to great problems. Lot of, uh, I could have picture after picture after picture of inappropriate use of um, repair materials. Now this is this archway is adjacent to a medieval turret and it is indeed a medieval archway but it has been rebuilt in the Victorian period when the gardens were being laid out. Uh, cement has been used at some stage in the past to um, repair the arch and you can see now all you're left with is the cement. When that was put in there was a nice lump of sandstone, sandstone here or two even. Now because the cement is too hard for the nature of the rock that it was um, being used with, the, it, it, the rock deteriorates. So back to the plan, here is the medieval castle, all this grey area here. 
extensive remains. So in 2016, a community enterprise company was set up. Uh, that was set up by the owner of the freehold of the site, who was the person who uh, was involved in the hotel and had bought the site in the early 2000s, but was aware um, of the importance of the medieval remains and the need to repair and refurbish them, but also aware that as um, owners of the hotel, they were never going to be able to do that work. The, ho the, the hotel building itself is in, um, in need of a lot of repair work. The setting up a community enterprise company, very like a charity, but it was in a community enterprise company allows you to trade. Um, it was set up with the view to try to raise funds and grant aid to repair the medieval masonry. So the, our primary aim, and I have been, I was aware of the trust being set up in 2016, but at that stage was still employed within the local authority, so wasn't a member of the trust, but was approached and asked to get involved once I retired, which I did. Um, and the primary aim of the trust is to halt the deterioration of the medieval masonry. This is the great gatehouse, uh, the main way into the medieval castle that we'll, I'll talk much more about shortly because this is an area where we have been able to do some conservation work. This photograph though is from about the 1940s um, and there has been a lot of deterioration since then. So we have a board of trustees, there's about seven of us, uh, there should be two representatives from the hotel, but currently we just have one, but we have town council representative, ex Caddo inspector of ancient monuments, local historians, castle specialists, uh, conservation experts, and myself who worked as county archeologist. And I was asked to become chair of the Ripping Castle Conservation Trust when the hotel was sold uh, in 2019. And at that stage, previous to that, the previous owner had been um, chair. So in those uh, six, seven years now, since the trust have been set up, a number of things have happened. And I will talk in a bit more detail about some of these. Initially in 2017-18, Cadu directly funded some emergency repairs to some of the medieval masonry, uh, some sticking plaster type work and I'll talk in a bit more detail about some of that. The idea of that was to be able to hold some of the masonry in place whilst a bigger project was being developed to come back and do the job properly. As a trust we've got an interpretive plan, we've had a feasibility study done looking at various elements and parts of which are quite useful. So we're gathering information that will be of use and value when we are at the point of being able to put in a larger um, funding application, hopefully to a body like the National Heritage Lottery Fund. During COVID, we, it sounds terrible, doesn't it? We, but we were able to uh, access some funds, some funds through um, the Cultural Recovery Fund that help keep, helped keep us going as a trust and through Catalyst Cymru, um, to get some coaching support to help us develop our governance. So all things that we are aiming to be putting us into a better position as and when we can get those bigger applications together. So as I mentioned, um, CADU directly funded some repair works in 2017-18, which is most unusual. They don't generally do that sort of thing. And normally CADU grant aid would be no more than about 50% of the costs. But they were very aware that unless they stepped in and directly funded some of this work, a uh, major collapse was going to take place. It was prompted by the fact that there was a collapse. Some face work on the um, curtain wall just one day was at the bottom of the wall, it had fallen off. So the um, direct funding of works looked at specific areas that, and that followed on from work done to develop a conservation management plan with a conservation architect alongside Man Williams structural engineers. So they together 
were able to identify the areas of masonry that were in the most imminent danger of collapse. Uh, and in the this um, is the first turret that uh, work was done on. It's this turret here on the Randall Holm plan, the Northeast Tower here on the modern plan. Uh, and as you can see, most of the face work has already come off that tower. It now is completely encased in a very sturdy chicken wire. The aim being to at least hold in place what is left there. The first stage of this Caddy Direct funding was basically giving the masonry a haircut. The whole of the site was covered in dense ivy and trees. Now that ivy and trees was not, it was, it was cut off at the surface, but the roots were not removed because we weren't in a position to follow up straight away with the necessary repair work that would have been needed had we removed all those roots. So it was given a haircut so we could see and understand what was there and do the emergency repairs, um, but not um, removing roots such that it would then cause further collapse unless we followed up with work straight away. Now this turret uh, is the one down here, oops, here on the Randall Holm plan down here. And you can see it here, it's one that if you visit the uh, castle site, you can quite happily walk into the upper area here, up here and look out across um, the curtain wall. And on this turret, you can see there's quite a lot of face work surviving. Um, and the solution five years ago was to put ratchet straps, basically sort of ratchet, here they are, these blue ratchet straps, basically the sort of thing you have, uh, I don't know if you're holding things onto a lorry or whatever, those sort of ratchet straps or on your roof rack, uh, and planks put. So the purpose of that and these planks here, and I think the next image is the same here, they are putting those planks in position, is to hold that face work in place. There are places where roots like this and trees like this are going right into the masonry and those roots, they seem to follow the back of the face work, so behind these stones, between the face work and the core work, pushing out those face stones. And if we hadn't put these um, planks here, some of that face work here would be on the ground. So that was done, that's a solution in another area. At the same time as these emergency repairs, there was um, archeological recording of the upstanding masonry in here. Um, plans and elevations that have been put together through photogrammetric work were hand annotated with the detail of the face stones that remained. Uh, by archaeologist Tim Morgan, who sadly has died since then. This work was funded by Riffin Town Council. So we got took the opportunity of the vegetation being off to record some of the face work and begin to understand what is there. The same time as doing this emergency repair work, uh, a combination of the conservation management plan and the structural engineers work identified other areas of work that needed to be done. This is the inside of the curtain wall uh, in the Italian garden area of the um, grounds of the hotel. Most of what we're looking at here, upstanding masonry, a lot of this is Victorian rebuild, but it is sitting on top of perhaps five, six meters of medieval masonry curtain wall, but it in itself needs a number of repairs. And these areas marked out are the areas that five, six years ago were considered in need of repair work. This is an area of um, the castle called the Ladies' Walk. If we go back to the Randall Holm plan, I pointed out this little corridor here where the Great Hall, we think, was, and certainly the Randall Holm plan annotates it, talking of the Great Hall, and then this walkway. 
Now that is replicated, all of this masonry is Victorian. And it's some sort of glass house, greenhouse area for growing particular types of you know, soft fruit, something like that. Because on the other side of this wall, there is evidence of heating and fires. Um, and along here, you've got evidence of it being a roof, but it was in a terrible state. Areas of these, um, the areas where the roof had been in um, were wanting to collapse and sections were falling out. This is the face work, the medieval face work that survives, and these are the openings in that walkway on this area here. And you can see this is a view of that wall. You, you don't get this view anymore because the vegetation has grown back, but you can see the medieval masonry here. And the fact that this sort of random rubble limestone is the rebuild in the Victorian period for the garden features but they must have known there must have been hints of that walkway there because they have repl replicated what was shown on the Randall Holm plan of the early 1600s and what's happened in here is a mass of timber work to support things so we've got a great this part of this is the outer wall looking out to the um this is the, the, on top of the curtain wall and here that's that same piece from the far end. So this is the outside. This section was wanting to completely collapse in here. And if that had happened, it, it, been, it would have been like dominoes. The rest of it would have collapsed. Uh, so this massive propping is holding that up. And a lot of this timber work here is, again, just holding stonework in place. And this is what it looked like um two well 18 months ago so about four years after it's been put in place bearing in mind these repairs or these sticking plasters really had been designed with about a five-year life span and we're all now we are beyond that five-year lifespan um so here we are at the postern gate the illustration of it this area here back doorway into the castle. There's evidence of a portcullis groove at this opening uh, and the mechanism presumably up behind this really nice corbelled out area. We're talking about this Western Gate, Postern Gate here, shown on the Randall Holm plan. And here there were um, areas that needed to be pinned back again with ratchet straps. Here again, the structural engineer highlighting areas that are in need of repair work. Throughout Rithin, the medieval remains of Rithin Castle, we're trying to unpick as well what is medieval, what is purely Victorian, what is Victorian rebuild of medieval masonry, what is Victorian um, building on top of medieval masonry. So it's a real uh, unpicking uh, job to do. But I Interestingly, this area where Man Williams, the structural engineer, had highlighted some quite serious um, repair work needed, this is where exactly the bride is standing just here. So it's used in um, advertising for the hotel, but does really need serious repair work. So after this work that Cadu uh, undertook, areas of the medieval castle were being pinned together with these sticking plasters, but fundamentally we are we were still left with a medieval castle falling down. Not but also a Gothic mansion in not too good a state. This is the um, Victorian gatehouse that was built for the Victorian house inside. And this is it today. Uh, the or it really very nice oriel window here, which you can see just there, um, fell down, I think it was two years ago now. And this is the stopgap sort of repair that has happened. These are the tops of the curtain wall and the turrets. Victorian rebuild of the very, just on the very top of the um, medieval masonry, but forming the sort of edge, if you like, to part of the garden area. But you can see you know, that is being held up. By the tree. Our builders, who we've now talked more about the builders and what they were doing uh, this last summer, summer 2022, um, but they had a very good um, 
way of measuring how stable or not some of the uh, masonry was could it take the landing of a peacock on it if it did well it was gonna it was all right and there are lots of peacocks around but you can see that none of this is in a good state and this is a again a victorian staircase but it, the whole site it, it, it's all important and from my perspective as chair of the conservation trust at my primary interest is the medieval castle but and our primary responsibility is the medieval castle but the picturesque gardens the list of buildings they are all important as well and this is a staircase that is currently unable to be used just as well because it, a lot of this um, balustrade here is held together with the ivy this um, is a bridge a wooden bridge that i think was put in when the uh, site was a hospital crashed through this is medieval masonry about three four meters wide crashed through that don't worry about that to build um this bridge that links two halves of the medieval castle we've got this central ditch in between uh, and the, the bridge got in a terrible state it has now been repaired this is it in the process of being repaired but um, and this is the central ditch of the medieval castle but there is massive amount more to do so there is active and severe collapse in the area of this medieval great gatehouse the initial work that was direct funding from cadu um, responded to what at that time were the worst areas of degradation five years later through some funding from um, COVID um, funds, we were able to readdress the conservation management plan. And at that indicated that this gatehouse was now in a state where it, it was in danger of imminent collapse. Looking at it, the, we, we presume that much of this, what is the upstanding area was Victorian. So this area here, and you can you get a hint of the sort of nature of the vegetation that engulfs the whole medieval site. But that we presume much of this upstanding area um, is Victorian rebuild, and certainly most of this is Victorian rebuild. But you can see you've got a lower, you've got a, an upper opening and a lower opening and in here we have got once if you're inside there it is medieval masonry and the very bottom of the wall here is medieval face work here we are underground so that if i go back to that previous slide that opening there is that the roof, the vaulted roof, is Victorian, put in when the Great Gatehouse was being altered, uh, built up again to, to recreate the medieval gatehouse as part of the picturesque garden. But what we're looking at down here, this is all medieval masonry. The much of the castle is made from red sandstone of which within the hill that it sits on is made it's a very soft um, stone if you had a better building material you would use it uh, and you can see that that has been collapsing you've got a concrete um, support to the floor above put in here and water seeping down either side of that which is degrade degrading the um, jams of that window there, there's been other collapse. This it's, it's very hard. But I'm going to tell you that this bit of walling is actually the sort of inside of the face work of a wall that would have been sort of out here, much, much wider. It's the back of one side of the gatehouse. Uh, and here, a staircase that leads down. This is that staircase here. 
again, medieval masonry, this very like features in other sites associated with Reginald de Grey, but in a terrible state. I mean, you, you just, you, you can see in the picture, but if you just touch that, you, it's like having sand on your hands. The masonry is returning to its, it, the um, sediment that made the rock. And here, another um, staircase down in, the, in a different area that you can see again, the collapse that is happening. So we need to try to get to grips with this. So we've got a, a, the gatehouse has two sides to it. The, the, it. the modern road goes through the middle. The original layers are much, levels of that gatehouse entrance are much lower. And on the other side, it does, it wasn't rebuilt in the Victorian period. This is another area of um, masonry that partly rebuilt in the Victorian period, but using the medieval masonry, but leads to underground areas within the castle. There are intriguing underground areas that are most probably areas that when the castle was in use were not underground. Levels have been raised to make the garden areas. But again, collapse of masonry. You can see a great heap of masonry down here that's come from the face work here. So as a trust, um, in 2021, we submitted an application to CADU for a, a substantial sum of money to begin to work on the medieval gatehouse. And um, we wanted to include vegetation stripping in that so we could really see what it was, what we were dealing with, a thorough laser survey, and then to be able to identify the main areas of concern, what needed repairing first, and then from that to work up a program of repair and recon reconsolidation of those areas of concern. And in October 2021, as a trust, we heard that we have been successful, which was fantastic. Uh, and the conservation architect called together the team, which included archaeologists, ecologists as well. We're dealing with a structure that's covered in vegetation and has underground areas, high likelihood of bats, not to say to say nothing of nesting birds and things like that, but certainly bats have needed structural engineers, people dealing with the CDM health and safety, and we needed constructors, con contractors. Um, and we worked very closely with CADU. Will Davis from CADU has been incredibly supportive of us um, in this um, program of work. And sorry, Mark, pardon me. And in um, October, uh, November. 2021, Dawn Bowden, who is the Deputy Minister for Heritage and Culture, visited Blithing Castle along with two other um, members of Senate, which was a great endorsement of what we we're doing. Obviously, she was coming to see where Cadu's money was going, but it, it, it did us no harm to have our profile raised. But we need to now make sure we follow up and, and ensure we spend um, the government's money wisely so that hopefully we get her there again and she can see what we've done with the money. So the work on the Great Gates House started in January last year, January 2022. And the first phase was to strip the vegetation off. Again, not taking out the roots until we were at a position to be doing the conservation work. Otherwise we would have, uh, had even worse problems than we did. And you can see the ivy roots are going right through the masonry. But the, this is medieval face work at the lower levels of the gatehouse. And we're talking this, this here. And you can see it's not an easy job getting all the vegetation off. You need um, contractors who know what they're doing. They were doing all the um, vegetation stripping um, in well, areas they couldn't reach. They're doing it from roped access. And so these two, I think, give you an indication of this is what it looked like in mid-January 2022. Bear in mind that's the winter. So all this is um, ivy, that stuff that keeps its leaf all year round. Uh, loads of saplings and vegetation on the site. Once that's gone, you begin to see what's going on inside. No one had been inside here well, for a number of years because you couldn't get in because you didn't know what what was there and whether it was safe. But straight away, we could see that uh, we've got the gatehouse area here. We've got a chimney here. 
and we've actually got two little fires down below on the inside and we've got brick partitions we've had quite a we've had an initial victorian rebuild on top of medieval masonry and then we've had little walls is, is there some sort of little cottage or something in there so that's the difference that the vegetation strips made and here just the inside views to show you that this wall is the same as this wall that's that chimney these two little fireplaces here but you, you can't see any of that really when you're when it, it and this is halfway through the stripping and this looking from the inside towards the external upper window a little bit of archaeological excavation work done talk about that in a moment so once it was clear and a structural engineer and conservation architect could get in safe knowing knowing they were going to be safe but also seeing the walls they could work their way around and identify programs of work wall by wall feature by feature so for um, all of the areas we had um, detailed drawings based on the um, photographs that um, the surveyor had brought together so here other areas and all these uh, the, you don't need to know the, the detail of what it's saying but basically the key is telling us what we need to do at different areas this was the small excavation that took place and so far that's all the excavation we've done tiny little hole really just to see because we knew there was a concrete pad and what was going on in the rest of the floor what we really need to do is do more of this now to understand because we've done we've done some conservation work in this upper level more about that in a moment but we've done nothing in that underground area and that is actively eroding because of the water that's getting down into there we need to do more work and to understand the floors inside here to know how that water is getting through where it's getting through how we can um, prevent it getting through uh, but as again january last year as part of the um, work done um, we had ross cook uh, do laser surveys of the upstanding masonry and we now have detailed plans of that masonry so for the first time we've got an accurate plan of the ground level and the below ground levels of this gatehouse so we, we can begin to understand what we're doing we've got these sort of stretched out elevations that the um, structural engineers and conservation architects can use for their work but also that act as an accurate record of the site before the work is done ross is going to return and do a record of what it is like now that that work has taken place but for the first time we, we know that the underground area is below the upper area obviously but we know exactly how it relates and when i was talking about the floor that that's the vaulted top so i look in this uh, go back sorry so that's the vaulted top of the underground area so what's going on in all this space you know, it, is that just earth is that where the water is all getting to that's what we now need to begin to understand as well so back to that um what it looked like when it was first cleared so we then had the plans from the structural engineers and the conservation architects of what work needs doing and here again that relationship of the below ground and the upper ground so through the spring and summer and up into the late autumn of last year uh, we were able to undertake conservation reconsolidation work and we paid as much attention to the victorian um, build as we were to the medieval build because it's all the same structure we need to be conserving everything and understanding everything and reflecting um, that history and that development of this gatehouse so that people visiting which hopefully when it, the work is finally complete they will be able to do so that they can visit and understand and see how that gatehouse has developed so this is inside where these um, brick walls are and we're looking back through we've got one of those fireplaces here one of those fireplaces there and there was a chimney here we had to take the whole chimney down and rebuild it this is the beginning part of it being 
rebuilt because it was in such a terrible state, virtually no mortar there at all. A lot of time on site visits spent peering at um, what looked to be fairly unprepossessing bits of masonry. But what do we do? How are we going to um, repair certain things? How are we going to ensure that the water isn't going to go into the wall, that it comes out of the wall? But do we replace with a modern brick, an old brick? How do we show where um, a roof line was and these sorts of things? And so lots and lots of detailed discussion. So here's that chimney being begun to be rebuilt. Here it is built. But if you look more closely here, we will key, these are bits of lead indicating a roof line. We were keen to preserve those and these new bits of brick that have been put in um, reflect where there was evidence of that roof line coming down. This brick, which is the front of the chimney effectively, has all been rebuilt and repointed. And this is a little dividing wall that was originally dividing that space into two separate chambers, a fireplace in each one. So an enormous amount of care taken. And you might say, well, that's just Victorian build and maybe dating to the 1850s. Why bother to do go to that sort of level? But it's all part of the structure. We need to be giving the same care and attention to the whole thing. One of the really exciting, well, for me, really exciting days on site was um, when we were starting to look at this opening here. Both jams had originally had brick lining them and our original plans were that yes that brick needed replacing it was in poor condition and poorly built but we would replace it with brick one day on site we were having a site meeting and we were thinking oh i wonder what's behind the lump of brick that was here uh, and the contractors were able to take that brick off while we were on site. It came, the mass that had been from here came off in one great lump to reveal behind it medieval core work. And this is all medieval core work, the strongest bit of masonry on the whole site at this upper level. And I suspect inside this great chunk here is medieval core work. So suddenly we don't want to cover that up with brick. We want to still be able to see that. But then we have to work out well, what are we going to do with this jam here? How are we going to rebuild that, but keep as much original as possible? Make sure that there isn't a great gap that you can get virtually your head into here and see the outside world through. So how are we going to conserve that, but make it so that you can still see this large area of medieval masonry and once we knew it was on the inside here when you go and look at the outside you suddenly you're aware it's out there as well so what we was done was to keep this area like this has this hasn't been repointed at all it's it's enough needing of that but core work has effectively been rebuilt here and new sandstone blocks put in here and this is just looking again from the top of the wall back towards that spotty area in the reconstructed chimney. We still have work to do. We've done some, a lot of clearing, um, some repointing and repair on this wall, all of this area complete, but we've got some of these castellations still to do, and we have to still do work underground. Whilst the work was taking place on site, we had some interpretation. This is this was um, a naught size attached to the Heros fencing, just to give people a bit of an idea of what we were doing and tell them about the castle and about the work. Um, and we organised some open days and some walks last year during Rithin um, Festival. I did two walks. I've taken a couple of groups there since and we will be doing the same this year. All of those things help raise the profile of it. And we will be putting a further application to CADI and we hope to begin to put together a bigger application to something like the National Heritage Lottery, maybe initially for a development fund to begin to work out how we can 
use lottery funding, which is, will be largely for community involvement, but also enable the site. Because you can see from the plans that we have earlier, we've, we've barely scratched the surface in the repair work here, and we have spent a lot of money. Um, so we have a big job ahead of us. We need to talk to the owners of the site. We have had initial discussions, but we need some sort of agreement with them written down that will satisfy bodies like the National Heritage Lottery and like CADU that if they put more money into this site, public access will remain. Currently, that's just down to goodwill. This little uh, image here is actually part of a painting in Chirk Castle, and it's suggested that it might actually, it's not very easy to see, be perhaps the only image we have of Griffin Castle. So we've, we've done a lot. We've been able to work our way forward. We've got conservation management plan. We've had that updated. We've, we did, were having conversations with the levelling up fund, but that, that hasn't come to fruition for the castle. It's come to fruition in other ways in Ripping, which is good. And we'll have conversations with the National Heritage Lottery Fund, but we have a lot more work to do. We can't be complacent, but we can at least look at what we have done and see that some work has taken place. So thank you very much indeed for listening tonight. And if you do have any questions about Riffing Castle, do ask. And if uh, you can, visit and have a good look round. Thank you very much indeed.